Hello there, brothers and sisters in Christ across Australia. Greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Rebecca and I are really glad to be back in Australia. We spent about three and a half weeks away, and that time was in the United States of America. The fertile ground from where the Church of God Seventh Day spawned around the world. We are very grateful for the generosity of our brothers and sisters in the United States. Rebecca and I attended the North American Ministerial Council held in Dallas. Of the 235 pastors that serve in the churches in the United States, there were 92 represented there. Robert Crawford from the United Kingdom was there from overseas. There was myself and there was also three pastors from Guatemala. This was a wonderful time for the church in the United States under the General Conference to come together as a ministerial council to do the business of ministry. I really enjoyed the fellowship. I took lots of photos, I listened intently, a lot of subjects, a lot of material, a lot of papers being proposed and wrestled with in a spirit of grace, in a spirit of care as I listened to the different pastors put forward different nuanced propositions for the benefit and the blessing of the Church of God Seventh Day. And it was a real privilege and a real honour. On the final day, on the Sabbath, when we invited all the churches in the neighbouring area, in Dallas itself, it has seven Church of God Seventh Day fellowships, five of whom are Spanish-speaking and two are English-speaking. So we had over a thousand people assembled in worship and fellowship and some mighty sermons and some beautiful singing all to God's glory and honour. And so we concluded our time in the United States knowing that God had blessed us. I felt moved by the Holy Spirit in a very deep and personal and profound way that I am in Christ and Christ is in me and that we are, as a part of the body of Christ, united in Christ with a vision and a purpose and a mission and a calling that gives us such a unique and powerful and enduring identity. Back here in Australia, I recognise there's a lot of work, a lot of ministry to be done within this great south land of the Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, God has called us to be participants in the great harvest of humanity. And you and I look often by ourselves and think, how are we ever going to accomplish this? How are we ever going to merit up to our Father's expectations, the stewardship given to us in Christ? You know, Apostle Paul says, you know, Paul planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. In other words, we're all invited to participate according to the gifts that God has given us. The church here in Western Australia, the church in Adelaide, the church growing in Sydney, the house churches elsewhere, including Geelong. And, brothers and sisters, the several calls from Queensland. Do you have a church of God's seventh day in Queensland? If we could, we'd plant one there tomorrow. So there's a work to be done. And I'm grateful as we talk about our identity in Christ and what it looks like in the next year ahead and how we're stepping into that space. And of course, God has blessed us like those in the United States with significant prosperity, significant peace and great opportunities to be a blessing to many other peoples. Here in Australia, we are part of Zone 6 of the International Federation, formerly known as the IMC, the International Ministerial Congress. And Zone 6 is the Pacific Rim, which starts from New Zealand, Australia, Indonesia, Philippines, reaching right on up into Japan. And we're really grateful. We recognise that we share in this extraordinary fellowship of different languages and different cultures and different ethnicities. But we talk about, we believe in, and we walk in the one God, in the one baptism, in the one Lord. I'd hoped to be in Sydney this weekend, in fact, but having just returned from the United States and just having gotten over jet lag, it was a little bit more prudent to to share this message from the studio here. I'm also looking forward in the next few weeks to visiting in Adelaide. And of course, in January, um, we're having a, um, I believe, there's a a get-together on the 11th of January at Sam and Debbie's home for that weekend. And and Rebecca and I hope, by God's grace, we have the funds to travel there. Um, what was I going to say? It just escapes my head now because there's a lot of things happening within the Church of God's Seventh Day on our watch, on our stewardship. I apologise about the edifier being a little bit late because I'm being away. I'd rather make sure that we have a quality magazine and anything that we do, please pray about it. Please pray for success of the next edition of the edifier. That somebody who reads something that's been written as your testimony can speak to the hearts and minds and help somebody to come to faith. You know, they say take seven to nine interactions with somebody 
before they'll respond. And I'm really encouraged, for example, with Emmaus equipping Bible college courses. I think we have 17 students and three facilitators. That's really encouraging. Now, I know in any classes there's always an attritional rate as the year goes on. I pray there isn't. But this is looking really promising as we look to raise up godly men and women into works of ministry according to the gifts that God has given us. And from that harvest, for men to hear the call of Jesus calling them to ministry, equipping them for discipleship, and to find out what your ministry is. See, the call to pastoral care and to eldership is very simple. You don't need a tertiary education. But you do need marital faithfulness, your relationships in your family well, and the only prerequisite is that you're able to teach. Remember the Apostle Paul was writing one in one of his letters, I think it's to those in Corinth, you're still on the milk of the word, by now you ought to be teachers. Now Jesus said, call no man rabbi, for you are all brothers and you have one teacher, the Christ. But if we are walking, talking image bearers of Jesus Christ, we extol and exalt him and work under his authority, under his spirit, under his guidance. So we're looking for a generation of men to rise up in what could potentially be adversarial times and times of potential extraordinary growth. And this gets back to our identity. What is our identity, the unique distinctives of the Church of God Seventh Day? And more personally, what is your identity? Who are you looking out from behind your eyes? And what is the calling? How do you see yourself as a viable, functioning, dynamic part of the body of Christ? You know, what's the reality that we live in? And it's easy, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So whatever we do and whatever we say and what are we prone to talk about is where our reality is. And sometimes I'm with people and I feel troubled in spirit because we talk about motorcycle riding and we talk about fishing and we talk about the weather and we talk about the latest football team or we, we talk about the, some Hollywood actress. And I'm sometimes dismayed because my heart and mind is in the Lord Jesus Christ in his purpose and his sovereignty and his deity and sometimes it's hard to swing a conversation. Have you experienced that? When you want to talk on a biblical framework on the tr about the transcendent and yet the person you're talking to just doesn't quite get it, is not there yet, doesn't quite see it? Well, brothers and sisters, we have a lot of work to do and that's one of the blessings of Emmaus equipping is to be able to begin to equip men and women into godly ministry and service. And, and from that, to be able to have a testimony that leaves no one in doubt. They know who you are, and you know who you are, and you speak in confidence. You know that the transcendent reality is greater than the transitory and passing nature of the physical. You know that. You believe that. You have the testimony of the prophets. You have testimony of Jesus. And we live by that in these times. And I want to talk a little bit about the to realize what the importance, the stewardship, and the origin of our identity and our testimony that emanates from that. That's really important to know. Because in this generation, more than any other generation, identity has become a really big issue. You know, young people are looking for identity. And there's plenty of pundits trying to dissuade them with, dissuade them with wokest left LGBT ideology to mess their lives up permanently, as the devil would have it. You know... When we think about all that we say and do, in what or in whom do we speak? Well, Paul said, whatever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what we do and what we say has to truly be in Jesus' name. And I think about that my former life, my younger life, my earlier days, my growing up in the faith. Not everything I said and did was truly in Jesus' name. It couldn't be signed off by him. But the more I fellowship and the more I grow in Christ, I hear also brothers and sisters with whom I stand shoulder and shoulder who are filled with the Spirit of God, who love the Lord Jesus Christ and live in oneness and harmony, recognizing his authority because everything that Jesus said and everything that Jesus did, he acknowledged the authority by which he was under. He said, the Father is greater than I. These things that I say and do is not me. It's the Father has told me what to say and how to say it and when to say it. And... We have a calling to do likewise. Jesus Christ modelled the Father. And you and I are the next link in that chain 
taking what's delivered to us and running with it. So the word comes from the Father. It's transmitted to us through Jesus Christ. It comes to us and we have a stewardship to pass it on. The good news of Jesus Christ, the good news of his kingdom, the good news of his victory over sin and death is at the heart and core of our testimony. And every week we try to find authentic ways to share the same one singular message. We have victory in Jesus, victory because of what he did on our behalf. He divested himself of his former glory to enter this world in the womb of Mary. And then at 33 and a half years of age, he divested his physical life so he could die taking on himself the sins of you and me and the rest of the world. And in the power of his resurrection, he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He said, I came to destroy the works of the devil, and that he did. So I want to go right back to the very beginning and establish our playing field as we spend a few minutes in conversation today. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the word... And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You have it in three stages there. There was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I will show you the importance of a pattern of three as we continue a little bit later in this message. He was in the beginning with God. And then we learn something else about him in verse 3. And this is John's introduction to Jesus Christ. He chooses the word logos, the Greek word of the highest form of wisdom and intellect and understanding and transcendence. And he says, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything that was made. So everything around us in this physical world, seen and unseen, was made through Jesus Christ. We'll come to the book of Hebrews shortly, where everything is sustained by the word of his power. So not only did he make it, and created all its beauty and diversity. I went into the garden the other day and I photographed some beautiful white flowers and I saw some red poppies growing in the garden on Remembrance Day here in Australia. And I looked at that and I was absolutely astounded at the intricate beauty. And then I listened to a scientist give a testimony about the moon. The earth sits at a 23 and a half degree axis and and moves a little bit as it circulates the sun by about two degrees. But if the moon wasn't there, in its elliptical orbit, it would actually cause the Earth to tilt 90 degrees in all different ways, so we, would be very on a, we wouldn't be able to live on this planet. But the Moon holds the Earth at almost, basically, 23 degrees tilt. And I'm thinking, was this coincidence? No. You and I see the creation, that which the Lord spoke, let us make man in our image. Let, let there be light, and there was light. And we see the voice of Jesus speaking the word and everything is sustained. And all that information that God spoke into existence is a physical world with its, all its unseen attributes that hold it together. This is Jesus. In verse 14 of John, when the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We'll come to that in a moment. John chapter 1, verse 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. It's a pity that most scientists today don't recognize where life comes from. Our life is hidden in Christ. Our purpose, our meaning, our identity is hidden in Christ. That's all I do. That's all we do as pastors is retell the same old story over and over again. That we can hear the word of God and through faith receive it and believe it and be transformed. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Remember in Genesis God said he separated a light from the dark? I look forward to understanding the continuums of what time is and what the separation of light and dark is. You know it's a metaphor for good and evil. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. We're talking about John the Baptist now. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. You know, through Scripture, the power of witness is very powerful. In Revelation, we read of Jesus as the faithful witness. And he tells his disciples before he ascends that you will be my witnesses. And so you and I take what Jesus gives us and what Jesus has, he's taken from the Father. 
And he gives us and he calls us into stewardship and to a functionality within the body of Christ. He came as a witness to bear witness to the light that all might believe through him. So you and I don't shine the light on ourselves. We just say, I simply plagiarize what comes from above. I'm taking the words of Jesus. I have no ownership. But I'm honored to be a steward of some beautiful grace that's been given to me. Speaking of John the Baptist, he was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. And the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. The true light. You and I see the sun rise every morning, a thermonuclear reaction that's been going on for who knows how long, that keeps us nice and warm, that melts the ice, that causes photosynthesis and plants to grow, creates vitamin D in our bodies. But the true light that gives life is not the sun. It's Jesus. You know, Jesus said the flesh counts for nothing. It's the spirit that's of merit. God is doing a marvelous work because those of us... Oh, let's read this. John chapter 1, verse 10. He was in the world, speaking of Jesus, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. Do you pick the triumvirate in the sentence? He was in the world, number one, and the world was made through him, number two, yet the world did not know him. When John writes, and elsewhere in Scripture, you can see a play on words which is more than just poetic license, it's divine inspiration. Jesus was in the world, and the world was made through him, and yet the world did not know him. How ironic. Verse one, chapter 1, verse 11, he came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. He came to the, the tribe of Judah. He came to the Israelitish people. He came to those who were children of Abraham, and they didn't recognize him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. So we can hear the three statement of emphasis again. Who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. The poetic license here to express divine reality is very powerful. And we'll encounter that again in the first chapter of Revelation. I mentioned earlier, John chapter 1 verse 14, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. The glory is the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And John chooses his words very carefully. How would you describe Jesus after having been with him for three and a half years and then reflected on it for 25 to 30 years afterwards when John finally put parchment to paper? He describes Jesus as being full of grace and truth. Grace is unmerited favor and truth. Jesus said, your word is truth. Whatever God speaks, And verse 16, for from his fullness we've all received grace upon grace. Unmerited favor upon unmerited favor. In fact, the idea of grace and grace comes from Zechariah, believe it or not, in chapter 4, verse 7, where in Zerubbabel building what he was commanded to build lays the very top stone and cries out, Grace, grace to it. Unmerited favor. For God's divine hand in upbuilding. And Jesus is the rock, the capstone, the cornerstone, the chief cornerstone, the stone by which the nations collapse, a stumbling block for all peoples, those who don't receive him. And finally, in verse 17, John reminds us of a, of a reality. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So the law epitomized in Moses through the first covenant, the old covenant. And grace and truth is the substance of Jesus under the terms of the new covenant. I want to turn to Colossians chapter 1 to establish this foundation of who we are, who God is, who Jesus Christ is, and the supremacy and the preeminence of Jesus Christ as head of the church, as Lord of our lives. Colossians 1.13, speaking of God, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness 
and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. I don't know what your former life was, but apart from Christ, we were living in darkness. A great darkness was over our hearts and minds, a darkness over the land. And in Jesus, a great light has shone. And we've been transferred into the kingdom of his beloved son. One day we'll be resurrected and we shall see him as he is, for we shall be like him as he is. Very hard to imagine when we live still in the flesh and we receive the Holy Spirit by faith. We pray by faith to a God who hears and we live by faith in the transcendent goodness and holiness and promises of God into the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So we are transferred into the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. There are three steps there that work together. Without the forgiveness of sin, without redemption, how can we be transferred into the kingdom of God? Speaking of Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. So you want to know what God looks like, what the Heavenly Father looks like? Look at Jesus, listen to his words, see his testimony, recognize his life. Philip said to Jesus, show us the Father and it will be sufficient for us. And Jesus looked at Philip and said, Philip, how can you say, show us the Father? Have I been with you so long? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And that's the oneness of Jesus Christ and his Father established as one. Speaking of Christ in verse 16, just like John tells us in the first chapter of John, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Well, John tells us that God, everything was created through Jesus. But now we learn that all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. And were created through him and for him. It's a profound thought when you begin to elevate our minds from the mundane and material to the transcendent and the glory of God. That's why Jesus calls us to fix our eyes on him, to, to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness as our defining attribute of waking up every day and going to sleep every night. And he is before all things in verse 17, and in him all things hold together. We have the privy of the macro and the micro world in science and looking at what atoms are and protons and neutrons and neutrinos and cosmic particles that have no matter. You know, a light, light is massless particles and everything in the whole universe is held together in Christ. And Jesus is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything... He might be preeminent. I know we are familiar with these scriptures. But sometimes the weariness and the ways of the cares of this life can distract us from the purity of our devotion to Christ. And that's what pastors are here as shepherds, of helpers of our collective joy, to remind us, to implore us, to empower and equip us by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit because faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Verse 19. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. That again is a profound statement. My Jesus, my Saviour, my Lord. And Jesus told us that he was one with the Father and that we are to be one with him. Christ in us and us in Christ, just as Jesus is one with the Father. Verse 20, and through him to reconcile to himself all things. That's what Jesus said. He said, when I'm lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. The greatest moment in all of history was the redemptive nature of Jesus Christ when he cried out on that cross, It is finished. And he gave up his spirit to God and died. And he was in the grave for three days and three nights. We've rehearsed that many times. And he was resurrected. 
And you, who were once alienated and hostile in mind doing evil deeds, that was all of us, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. So do you see yourself as holy, blameless and without reproach now? Because you have every reason to do that, to receive Jesus, to believe in his name, to repent of your sins and to stand before the Father in the righteousness of Jesus and to be empowered in this age to live our lives to his glory. Okay, the third major passage we want to look at is Hebrews chapter 1. Again, it points to Jesus. And if, if everything about our church is anchored in the right place, we can handle any tempest that comes from within or without. Many times when there's a challenge in the church, the question that I ask my, my thoughts on it, how Christ-centered has the dialogue been? How Christ-centered is the theology that's governed the minds and the hearts of the congregants? It's a good question. It might seem simplistic, but that's the heart and core of it. Hebrews chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. So there was Jesus, instrumental in the Father's will and desire and hands. The voice that spoke at creation, the voice that thundered from Sinai, the testimony of Jesus in those three and a half years on this earth. And his word, brothers and sisters, now written on our hearts. We believe on account of the testimonies of those who have gone before us. And we believe and hold that dear as the only transcendent reality that is that gives us hope because there's no other hope elsewhere. Speaking of Jesus in Hebrews 1.3, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Now, your translation may read a little bit different. This is the English Standard Version, and I find this to be a very good and authentic translation. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus says in Revelation 3.20, To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, even as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Do you understand the significance of that claim to those in Laodicea who had yet to embrace Jesus? Jesus sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited, it's much more excellence than theirs. And the, and the author here goes on to say, For which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you? Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. So above all the angelic beings, Jesus holds a place that's preeminent because he was there in the beginning. And he spoke all, visible and invisible, into existence. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Remember in Luke, the shepherds were exposed to angelic choir, worshipping God, praising that the Saviour was born. So they went on to see this thing. Then we come to Revelation. And we see that the angels, the 24 elders, the great multitude of angelic beings sing praise to the Lamb and to him who sits on the throne. And it's ongoing exaltation and praise. So every Sabbath when we gather together and we sing hymns, we are joining the angelic chorus through all the ages, praising God, because without the, all the creation, we wouldn't exist. And science, in its guise under atheism, tries to tell us that you and I are nothing more than a cosmic blink of cosmic consciousness between two oblivions. And that's the biggest lie that's focused on, foisted on our society, especially our youth. Verse 18, But of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of rightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. So brothers and sisters, even though we'll be raised one day to see the very face of Jesus and stand in our Father's presence and be like Jesus and sit on Jesus' throne, 
Jesus will have a joy of gladness beyond all his companions. He will always be preeminent. And you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. Like a robe, you'll roll them up. Like a garment, they will be changed. So all the physical, all the limitations of this age one day will be gone. But you are the same and your years have no end. I hope your testimony in Christ is becoming stronger. It is with me. I find myself very open now in the public to talk about Jesus and sharing his word and the importance of the lordship of Jesus as part of our narrative. And, you know, I'm really surprised. People are more than amenable. After almost 30 years of doing computer work, I have known a lot of people and Customers, businesses, and homeowners are no longer customers or clients. They've become my friends. And so as the years go on by, I can talk openly to them. And they're very amenable to it. I think there's a great harvest coming. And I'm really excited to be a stewardship, to be a steward as this process unfolds. We may plant, we may water, but we give God the credit because he grants the growth. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. I want to talk about stewardship and the chain of command that you and I are entrusted with. Revelation 1, 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the thing that must soon take place, he made it known by sending his angel to his servant John. There's a lot in that. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And where did he get that from? which God gave him. The Heavenly Father gave Jesus this revelation. It was transmitted by a mighty angel and was given to John. And John, write to the seven churches, tell this message. And John's vision surpasses the seven churches and tells us the broad brushstrokes from Genesis to the new heaven and the new earth. Very powerful and really encouraging. You see God the Father, Jesus Christ, a mighty angel, John, and all the churches. And that chain of command exists today. And you and I are part of that. Who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Listen to the triumvirate in the structure of these verses. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the word of this prophecy, Number two, and blessed are those who hear, and blessed and those who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. So there's a calling to read the word of God. There's a a blessing for those who hear, and then not only hearing, but taking it to heart and keeping it. And the message is, for the time is near. John to the seven churches in verse 4 that are in Asia. Grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, and is to come. So we see a pattern of three again. From him who is, who was, and is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, number one, the attributes of Jesus, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and ruler of the kings of the earth. So we're given further descriptors as to Jesus Christ. In the next chapter, you'll see a visual description of Jesus. But here, we're given the attributes of Jesus. He is the faithful witness. He's taken what the Father has given on him and through the chain of command has given it to us, the church. The faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, so it speaks of his death and resurrection, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. There's a lot in that sentence. To him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father. In that phrase are three things as well. To him who loves us, number one, who has freed us from our sins, number two, and number three, has made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father. 
there is a powerful progression of the chain of command. And in that chain of command, a clear sequence as to the attributes associated with Jesus. To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And John writes, Behold, he's coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so. Amen. Every eye will see Jesus, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Do you know it was your sin and my sin that pierced Jesus? So everybody will see him. It was your and my sin who pierced him. And the tribes of the earth will not be happy about it. We read that elsewhere in Scripture. And finally in verse 8, Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and is to come, the Almighty. There we have the triumvirate and the three emphases. Jesus who is, Jesus who was, and Jesus who is to come. I won't go there today because we're tired, we're running out of time, but we go to Revelation chapter 10. And we see the imagery of a line of transmission again with the scroll. The scroll message comes from the Father. It's the revelation given to Jesus. And we see a mighty angel holding a little scroll. The angel is so big that the scroll looks small. And he's commanded by to John to take and eat the scroll of the angel. So he takes the scroll of the angel and it's sweet as honey in his mouth, but it's bitter in his stomach. And the question is, what does it mean? And so after John eats it, he's told by the angel, you must again prophesy in Revelation 10, 11, about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. John had a message that came from the Father through Jesus Christ, through a mighty angel, to John, to the churches, reaching down to you and I today. That you and I are part of this process of sharing the gospel to many peoples and nations and kings and languages. And John's letter to the churches and what we've covered today, number one, establishes the preeminence of Christ, the redemption, redemption that you and I have for sin, the freedom and the liberty and the equipping and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to stand in the space as truly ambassadors of Christ in this age. Brothers and sisters, our identity is in Jesus and in Jesus alone. And our calling is to do his will, even as Jesus' calling was to do his Father's will. What did Jesus say? Matthew 6.33 Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. In fact, we learn from Paul that we are given the free gift of righteousness. So you and I can truly be image bearers of Jesus. And the things that everybody seeks, food, clothing and shelter, and whatever your needs are, Jesus promises will be added to you. So you don't have to say, what are we going to eat? What are we going to wear? Where are we going to live? There's a divine promise to equip us and strengthen us with a powerful testimony so we can authentically be about his will and work to many nations, languages, ethnicity and tribes. I believe that we as a part of the body of the Christ in the Church of God's Seventh Day here in Australia... I give credit to 29 years of Pastor Phil's work. Last month while we were in Dallas, Texas, I confessed to the other pastors that I felt the loss of Pastor Phil. The last two years, I would say, has been some of the most challenging and the hardest in my life. I loved working with Phil. But God doesn't allow us into a situation that he doesn't prepare or equip us for. And I believe the church is set to continue growing and maturing as never before. We are. You know, one of the things that Phil said about the church is that here in Australia we are Christ-centred. And I hear that echo from the church right around the world, all for the glory of our Father in heaven. And the church in Adelaide, when it was reconstituted in the late 70s, early 80s, the mission under Phil's pastorship was, we are a Christ-centred church and we will focus on charitable work. In other words, as Jesus said, as you've done it to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it to me. I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was in prison, and I was sick, and you came to me. As you've done it to the least of these, my brethren, says Jesus. You have done it to me. And so thereby, here in Australia, the gospel has been proclaimed. 
and is being proclaimed. Now there's other utilities as we experience church growth, as more men and women are equipped to the to gifts that God has given. As we, like, for example, across Australia now, published the Edify magazine. As we are now embarking on this year for the very first time in Australia, Emmaus equipping Bible college classes, a non-accredited Bible college to equip men and women for their gifts to raise pastors. We have a strong online presence. One of the oldest websites here in Australia is the Church of God Seventh-day website. And many people have come in contact with our church family through our website. You know, we are represented through live streaming every fortnight. We have hundreds or thousands of videos on the web and message week. We have a Facebook profile, a YouTube presence. And the Church of God Seventh Day in Australia is a charter member of the Church of God Seventh Day International Federation. And we stand along brothers and sisters in Christ um, for His glory as people who were born for such a time as this, knowing what to do and knowing what to say because we anchored in Christ. We are called, brothers and sisters, in everything that we say and do, to plant and water and to be about our Father's business because we know it's God who gives the growth. And I've seen some fantastic growth in, some, in the recent years. And I'm so grateful because I know it's God's Spirit at work. Our job as pastors across this country, it was wonderful to be in Dallas, to share rub shoulders with 92 other pastors and the many others that were there, is to remind all of us, near and far, that the transcendent to which Jesus testified is so much more real than the passing and transitory nature of this physical material world in which we live. And we do it every way and every week through prayer and song and pastoral edification scripture reading to say that as Jesus said, the flesh counts for nothing, it's the spirit that matters. I wish I could be in Sydney this weekend and in Adelaide and in Perth and in Queensland and visiting in between. Continue the good work that God has begun in us and let our conversation and our conduct reflect his glory and speak his words and honour God in all that we can be. I'm looking forward to being in Sydney shortly. I'll be there on the first Sabbath in December and shortly afterwards again in Adelaide. May God bless you, encourage, strengthen us as we know our identity, we recognise our Lord. Every Sabbath we look at creation, we celebrate redemption and we say, even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, on behalf of the Church of God Seventh Day here in Australia, I'm your brother, John Classic. <laughs>